Hello, we're at the University of Georgia at the Special Collections Library. This is March 4th, and my special guest today is Robert Corum, a true Renaissance man and one of my former colleagues in journalism. Robert has written 13 books on subjects ranging from military commanders to the United States War on Drugs. He also has played a significant behind-the-scenes role in Georgia politics. He served as press secretary to former Governor Carl Sanders in his Democratic uh, primary contest way back in 1969 and 1970. Sanders lost the race, but his principal opponent, Jimmy Carter, went on to become President of the United States. In addition, Robert went on to serve a stint as a park ranger on Cumberland Island. And oh yes, he and I once embarked on a fishing expedition uh, for sharks on the end of Cumberland Island. Uh, Robert, let's, uh, let's talk for a few minutes about your early uh, stint on Cumberland Island. Tell, tell me something about that. How'd that go? And why I was Cumberland chosen? You made the point that many Georgia islands have been preserved. And I think Cumberland is one of the most important of the coastal islands. People of Georgia think so. Uh, I went there with a unique skill set in that I went there in 1974, the year before the park opened. It had officially been a park for two or three years before that, but there were only a couple of park rangers there. The park wasn't open to the public. For a year, I was a caretaker at one of the private homes. In 1975, I believe in June, the park opened to the public. And because there were no rangers within the system who knew the island, they hired local people. And I was one of them. I was one of the first rangers on Cumberland Island. And so I saw the island both from the standpoint of a caretaker. I was one of 11 people who lived on the island. And then from the standpoint of a park ranger. So I, I experienced both sides of that equation during what was a very tumultuous time for the island. I think any time a large piece of property goes to the government, in this case from private ownership uh, into the National Park Service, there's a, there's a transition period and it can be rough. And that was particularly true on Cumberland because uh, the landowners fought the Park Service tooth and nail. Um, they did not like the sight of people in uniform. And after I became a ranger, when I went to island parties, I, I'd take off my uniform as quickly as I could because, um, and wear my caretaker's uniform, which is barefooted in blue jeans and a t-shirt. There, <laughs> there was a lot of animosity toward the Park Service that first year, and it is still, still there to some degree. Before we go on to something else, speak about your view of all the barrier islands along the Atlantic, Atlantic seaboard, particularly in the southeast of which Cumberland was one. If you look at a map of the eastern seaboard, uh, many of the states have barrier islands, Florida, uh, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia. On almost all of those islands, except for a few off the coast of North Carolina, they're developed with golf courses and uh, condominiums and just overdeveloped, bri almost always bridges. There are a few, but Georgia has an 80-mile stretch of barrier islands in the, they've been preserved through a unique set of circumstances. There are three bridges to the barrier islands in Georgia, one at Tybee on the north end, one at Jekyll toward the south, one on St. Simons. And in between, there's 80 or 90 miles of where there are no bridges. And those islands, because of wealthy owners federal government, the state government, have been largely preserved. Only Tybee, uh, St. Simon Sea Island, and Jekyll have been uh, developed. It's a, a treasure unequaled in America. And I, and I think about two-thirds of the marsh on the eastern seaboard are in Georgia. And marsh is the home, the development for many of the uh, uh, fish and uh, the seafood that we eat, eat have all are part of their life cycles in the marsh. In view of the history of the Georgia legislature and dealing with coastal properties and state land, how do you account for the fact that Georgia stands out in the southeast in protecting its uh, barrier islands? 
I think much of the credit, if not most of the credit, should go to the wealthy families who own those islands and who, for whatever the reason, uh, maintain them in their pristine state. They're largely undeveloped. Uh, for financial, like the great homes in England, a lot of the islands had to be transferred over to government ownership. Uh, uh, Asaba, uh, Wausau, uh, Cumberland, largely to the feds. Uh, Jekyll is mostly a state island. So, but I send it back to the original, uh, to the wealthy owners who took care of those islands. I can't let, let this opportunity pass without asking you about a famous shark fishing trip. You and I took off Jekyll Island and went back to the people who promoted Jekyll and said how proud we were that we had found a fertile shark fishing ground and nobody patted us on the back. <laughs> off the south end of Jekyll, between Jekyll and uh, Little Cumberland in St. Andrew Sound is a place called the 80 Foot Hole. And it's, uh, I don't know if it's a breeding ground, but it's, it's just filled with sharks. And you and I went out there and fished and caught a number of sharks. And you, anyone who goes there will catch big sharks. And I've caught 12 and 14 foot sharks in the 80 foot hole. And the people on Jekyll and St. Simons don't like stories in national magazines talking about the big sharks right off the coast of Jekyll. I wonder uh, why. I'll tell you another part to that. As several years I covered the uh, world's biggest shark fishing tournaments held every year on July the 4th in uh, Jacksonville. Uh, I've covered it for Sports Illustrated. One of those years, the biggest shark was caught in the surf off Jekyll. There were people swimming beyond where this 14-foot hammerhead shark was caught. Uh, I don't go swimming off the Georgia coast. I don't get in the water over my ankles. That seems like a wise move, a, a story that ought to be circulated. <laughs> uh, but let, let's skip around a little bit. Uh, I think you're probably the foremost authority in this country as a, as a writer on the uh, American war on drugs uh, that has gone on now 20 years maybe without any appreciable uh, success. Talk, talk a little about the war on drugs and how you covered that war in its early stages. Bill, I came to it in a, a unique way. In 1976, I was living with my brother. Uh, he and I had both recently been divorced and we were living together. He had just gotten out of the Marine Corps and was in the reserve unit up at Dobbins. And his ground duty was as an intelligence officer. He was in graduate school and uh, working with the Marines on the weekends. He came back one weekend and said, you would be amazed at the numbers of small aircraft penetrating the ADIS, the Air Defense Identification Zone. It's an invisible line about 20 miles off the coast, and you're supposed to have a flight plan when you fly through it, and so uh, Air Defense knows who you are. He saw it as a national defense issue. I saw it as a great story. He said, guys are bringing tons and tons of drugs into the country and nobody knows about it. I think I was one of, if not the first person to start writing about narcotics trafficking on a regular basis. It's unfortunate, but I had the field uh, largely to myself in part because many, if not most reporters were using the products that I was writing about and they didn't want any, any to write about uh, their sources. Uh, I, I wrote a great deal about it, and the more I wrote, the better my sources. Uh, in the early days, there's been a progression in the drug business. In the beginning, it started out with college kids bringing maybe a suitcase full of dope back from Hawaii or from Columbia. And then they started bringing in airplanes, and it was good old boys. They had bandanas wrapped around their heads, and they weren't armed. And if they were arrested, they'd say, well, you caught me speeding. And they'd maybe serve a short sentence and go right back to work. It, it, as cocaine and, and Colombians got into it, it got much more violent. But in the early days, it was just a lot of fun, guys hauling dope. Um, law enforcement was lax because law enforcement didn't know the magnitude of the problem. Um, when I started writing about it, being early, it had a lot of advantages, both domestic and foreign. It was a big advantage to be one of the early guys because there was something curious about an American reporter 
being in Columbus, and I got to interview the vice president of Columbia, and he was, why are you here? And he said something I had never forgotten. We tend to blame the other countries as being the reasons for the problem. Columbia is a bad place because the uh, marijuana is grown there. And the vice president said to me, all we do is grow it. We don't have a drug problem. We grow it, we put it, put it on, on airplanes, and it goes to your country. You, you are the market. If there were not a market, we wouldn't be growing it. A couple of years later, I was in the Turks and Caicos, which geographically was halfway between Colombia and Florida and a major transshipment point. And I interviewed the, um, the governor of the Turks and Caicos. It's still a crown colony. And he said, America is the problem. All we are is a transshipment point. We provide gas. Our local people make money providing gas to these planes filled with drugs that are coming through. But if there weren't a market in America, uh, there wouldn't be a, a business here. We don't have a drug problem. And I realized that America tends to blame the source country and the transshipment points when the real problem is right here with the consumers. And we've been engaged for 30 years or so on what's called a war on drugs. It's been ineffective from the get-go. Uh, we've not been able to eradicate it in the growing places. It, spraying paraquat or having these quasi-military operations has done nothing. We haven't affected the transshipment points along the way. Law enforcement on this end has been relatively ineffective. There have been some big busts, but even a blind hog can find an acre once in a while. And the drugs are still flowing in today, now from Mexico, in, in greater amounts than ever. Um, the war on drugs, it's a war in name only because it's been completely, totally ineffective. But what, do you, what do you think the solution is the prisons are already filled up with people who are using drugs. I mean, the pr prison population in this country is bigger than it's ever been. Yeah. I can't give you numbers off the top of my head, but I know that minor drug offenders are serving extremely long prison sentences at the taxpayer's expense. Yeah, th I think those are mandatory. Uh, certain offenses, you automatically get a certain sentence there. Right. Um, if you're headed toward legalization, I'm not ready to go that far. Frankly, I don't part. see the the logic in saying legalization will cure it because what do you legalize? Who's in charge? There's so many more questions and I think it opens up more uh, treacherous ground than what we have now. For in this, I'll give you a personal uh, response to that and I, I don't know if I'm right or not. I, I think that people take drugs because it fills a need in their life. It makes them feel better. Um, how do you fix something in the American culture to make people feel better uh, without having to resort to drugs? And I don't know the answer Isn't to that. Is it the same parallel with prohibition? Uh, I mean, it created for the first time real organized crime in the United States, which is still with us. Yeah, and we certainly have an organized crime problem with drugs. Uh, the uh, Mexican border uh, from beginning to end is, is, is a war zone. People are moving out because they're unsafe. Um, I don't know the answer. I don't, I don't know how to fix it. I just know that we are the market. Um, and when we no longer have a need to alter our thinking through psychotropic substances or mind-altering substances, when the market dries up, the uh, supply will dry up. It, but I don't know the answer. Uh, before we started this tape, you mentioned that you had written a lot about it, a lot that had not been published, and that you turned it into novels. How about exploring that for a minute? When I was writing for the Atlanta Constitution, uh, I was brought back to the paper as a freelancer and given the exclusive mandate to write only about narcotics trafficking, which I did for two or three years and then was brought on staff again. Um, Many of the stories I came across in South Florida, uh, Jamaica, the Turks and Caicos, and Colombia, I couldn't nail things down enough to get them into the newspaper. So I wrote my first uh, four novels were about drug smuggling, and it was based largely in, on information I had gotten as a newspaper reporter. You've written a lot of biographical material on obscure military figures, at least 
military figures that are not household words like Schwarzkopf and people like that. Uh, and they turned into big, big sellers. Tell us about that. When I write a biography, I, I try, I don't want somebody like Schwarzkopf whom everybody knows. I don't want a guy who's got a lot of medals or filled with braggadocio or, or just some romping, stomping, bigger than life personality. I look for what I call the moral component. I want to write about a man who came to a fork in the road and who took the, he did the right thing and he paid the price. Uh, because that's more than a military book when you do that. And I've been fortunate in uh, finding three of those. Finding the right person is the biggest problem. Uh, first one I wrote about was John Boyd, who is the most important military theorist since Sun Tzu some 2,000 plus years ago. Uh, he's changed the way the Marine Corps, Army, and to some degree the Air Force think about warfare today. He was the brains behind Gulf War One, uh, an extraordinarily brilliant man whom nobody had ever heard of. Uh, the second book was about a Colonel Bud Day who uh, was a POW in Hanoi. John McCain was his roommate, and uh, he, uh, two POWs escaped Mother's Day, 1969. Of course, being tall, fair Caucasians in the middle of Hanoi didn't help for their disguises, and they were caught within hours, and one was uh, killed in the subsequent beating, and then the POWs went through the building where Colonel Day was the senior ranking officer and began torturing the junior officers, working up to him. And when he came, he knew they would get to him because he was a senior officer, and he uh, asked himself, how am I going to handle this? What will I do? And he boiled it down to a very simple equation. He said, I will not do or say or write anything that will embarrass my family my Air Force or my country. And when they brought him in to torture him, they stripped him, tied him face down on the ground, and two men were beating him systematically. And he uh, kept track of the lashes up to 300 and then lost count. Um, he was dying, and he could have stopped the beatings any time by the simple expedient of signing a document saying he thought the war in Vietnam was immoral. Uh, uh, Attorney General of the United States had said the war was immoral. Uh, half the members of Congress had said the war was immoral. College students all over America were demonstrating. Most of America believed the war was immoral. But Bud Day did not have that luxury. He was a serving officer in the hands of the enemy in time of war. And his conduct was dictated by rather rigid rules. And he stuck the rules. And he would have died before he had violated that code. And um, the he guards. Did he did survive, and is he still with us? Is he still surviving? He survived. The guards knew he was dying, and they slacked up on the beatings. And then a couple months later, Ho Chi Minh died, and the POWs entered a period of relative tra tranquility. He came back home in the spring of 1973 and became the most decorated living American officer. He was awarded the Medal of Honor, the Air Force Cross, some 50 combat medals. He's probably the most venerated man in the U.S. military today. Any branch of the service, they all know Bud Day. He's dying right now. He's got uh, advanced esophageal cancer and is having a terrible time. He's almost 90, uh, but he, when he dies, it is going to be, uh, you will know about it. It'll be on the front page of papers all over America. And nobody had ever heard about this guy. And the same with my last guy, a military, uh, a Marine three-star who was probably the most influential Marine in the history of the Marine Corps. Uh, uh, you've just read the book about somebody we have heard a lot about, Colonel Scott, Flying Tigers, yeah. all that good stuff from World War II. Tell us about that book. Give yourself a plug. Well, I have, I'm just getting cranked up on it. It's a year or two years down the road, but uh, he was a Macon boy. Uh, how he got into West Point, I'll never know, because he flunked out of uh, high school, but he did. He got into West Point, graduated. He was near the body. He was 256 people in his class, and he ranked 256 in about every single category. Um, I don't know how he graduated, but he managed to go to China, and he flew with Chenault and the Flying Tigers, then came back. In three days, he wrote, God is my co-pilot. 
a book that sold millions of copies. There was a, a movie. A there's a movie that film. came right after that. It was one of the great propaganda films of World War II. It was just pure hokum, but it resonated with people in America. We needed heroes at that time, uh, and there weren't many. This was early in the war, and Japan in the spring of 1942 was winning everywhere. We were losing everywhere. And there comes this long, tall, lanky, BS-spouting guy from middle Georgia who just has a line a mile long, and um, he promoted himself. He always wore a white scarf, and he had great stories to tell about shooting down Japanese and uh, wrote an amazing book. Well, he's deceased now, but yeah. did you ever meet him in life? I did. Um, I did a profile of him for the New Yorker back in the early 90s and spent about three months with him. And uh, later the profile was killed by a new editor who came in. But I'm a uh, pack rat and I kept those notes and I have 430 some pages of typewritten notes of my time with General Scott. So it's, I've got good stuff. That's, that's great, but let's talk about something that you and I share a great interest in, and that is Georgia politics. You served as uh, press secretary to Governor Sanders in 1969 and 1970 when he attempted to be reelected to a second term as governor of Georgia. By way of background, he was first elected in 1962. He was the first Georgia governor in years to be elected by the popular vote because the county in his system had been thrown out. And he was also a progressive and a moderate who emphasized education, particularly higher education. Uh, he also built landing strips all over the state and did a lot to affect to transportation and to bring big league sports into Atlanta. Uh, I remember when he announced he was going to run again for governor that a lot of us cheered because they said that would be a good thing because he was an excellent first term governor. But something happened. You pick it up, Bobby. Here's what happened. From the time he was first elected in 62 until he ran again in 69, 70, a lot happened in Georgia. The civil rights legislation of 64 and 65 the Supreme Court ruled against separate but equal schools. Uh, by then, uh, many Georgians had voted uh, uh, for Goldwater over uh, Johnson. They had voted for Wallace. Both men lost. Georgians, the average middle class, lower class Georgians, were feeling disenfranchised. Uh, the school issue was the issue in Georgia. Sanders thought, he was a lawyer, and he thought that issue had been resolved by the courts, and this is not the major issue that should be taking up the time of the people in Georgia. But the people in Georgia thought it was the main issue. And I remember Senator Hugh Gillis, Jim Gillis's son, came to our office one day and said, Hugh Gillis being the highway czar and the political, his son, his political son. kingmaker. Correct. Three years back. Correct. Yeah, right. yeah. And his son was a prominent state senator. And he came to our office and said, you got to talk about schools. He said, people know, he said, it's like going to a funeral. People know you can't resurrect the deceased, but they want you to hold their hands and tell them it's going to be okay. And Sanders wouldn't do that. He thought a leader should not be of the people, but somebody who led the people, who led by example. He would never say, as did Lester Maddox, don't send your children to private schools. That issue had been decided by the courts, and Sanders would not go against that. We, we, the campaign staff, completely underestimated the depths of the racism in Georgia in 1970. You also underestimated Jimmy Carter, right? Jimmy Carter did research. He listened to his researchers. He ran the most racist campaign I had ever seen. And uh, I'll give you some examples of things he did. He adopted the George Wallace slogan, Our Kind of Man. He sent out what was called fact sheets at the time, little flyers. You just type something on them that's not true and form it out to everybody. And one of these, he said that Carl Sanders and Julian Bond had formed an alliance and the people of Georgia should be worried. In fact, Carl Sanders and Julian Bond hated each other's guts. They didn't even talk to each other. But there was this fact sheet out there. 
the Julian one that, Bond, for those who don't know, was a big figure in the civil rights correct. movement. Correct, yeah. And, and SNCC, the Student Nonviolent yeah. yeah. Coordinating Committee. And the legislature and, wouldn't seat him. And the legislature was, refused yeah. to seat him. Yeah. So he became uh, emblematic of the entire civil rights movement. Well said, Georgia, well right? said. But here's the thing that Carter did that bothered me then and bothered me now. Um, Sanders was a part owner of the Atlanta Hawks. In one of the games that the Hawks had won, Sanders is wearing a suit and tie, and Dominique Wilkins, tall black basketball player, is pouring a bottle of champagne over his head. Uh, Carter took that picture, made hundreds and hundreds of copies. Ham Jordan took thousands those and thousands. thousands of copies, took them to the gates at Lockheed during a shift change and passed out these pictures of a black guy pouring champagne over Sanders' head, saying, is this the kind of guy you want for a governor of Georgia? They also mailed them to every white barber shop in the state and every white beauty salon. Thank you. It, uh, but it was reprehensible. Carter, the basic, here's the arc of the story of that campaign. Carter conducted research, he listened to his researchers, he did what he had to do to get elected. Sanders believed in the rule of law. He stuck to the high road. He did not, would not, could not be a Georgia or a Southern politician and cater to the base needs or the wants of the electorate. He was a leader. He would stand above and say, follow me, show me the way. He stuck to the high road and he lost. Well, he lost, but if you had to run that campaign or be a driving force behind that campaign today, what would you do? Or could a guy like Sanders even get off the ground in today's environment? We once had uh, very good photographers follow Sanders for about four or five days, got I don't know how many hours of footage. And Reamer Tyson, who had been the political editor of the uh, paper and sort of a liaison between the advertising agency and the campaign, and he and I worked together closely. Um, Reamer wanted to get some relaxed, uh, down-home, feel-good footage of Sanders, just showing he's a good guy. Is Somebody, that wearing the blue sweatsuit? <laughs> we, we got about five minutes of relaxed footage out of a dozen hours of, Sanders couldn't relax. He was just he just couldn't relate. And if you look at the footage of the campaign today, he's wearing the tie and all buttoned up and he's stiff and um, he, he just couldn't relate to people. And Carter, everybody would call Jimmy and rush up to him and pat him on the back. And Carter painted uh, Sanders as this cufflinks wearing wealthy uh, aristocratic. Said he went to the Gold Room and the Capital yeah. City Club. To get All to nonsense, get, utter to nonsense. Collect money. But oh. in fact, it was Carter who went to the Gold Room and he got the. The floor. irony is that Carter probably was wealthier than Sanders. Uh, he, yeah, if I remember the campaign, they asked Sanders to show his net worth. Carter showed his, and Sanders wouldn't do it. Not and, until the runoff. Until it was right into yeah, the runoff, yeah. right. By the time we got in the runoff, it was just all downhill. We couldn't do anything right. Uh, we decided to start sending out fact sheets, and we'd put them on Sanders' airplane, and somehow the Carter people would find out when that airplane was landing, and they would come up and say, we're here to get the fact sheets. And they would take them and go have a bonfire. None of our fact sheets ever. Larry Lloyd, whose role I still don't understand in the campaign, took a lot of Betty Sanders' artwork and had calendars made now, and he was passing Larry it. Lloyd was a well-known political and state government operative. I don't know what he did. I've been, <laughs> he was the only person in the campaign who called the governor by his first name. Uh, they were very close, but what he did, I do not know. But Larry was passing out Miss Betty's calendars and he said, if Miss Betty's calendars last, we're going to win this campaign. <laughs> <laughs> and then after the campaign was over, Reamer Tyson said, somebody took Miss Betty's calendars and didn't vote for us. But it was <laughs> Well, uh, now, Georgia, you and I have seen the, the torch pass from the Democratic Party, of Georgia being a solid Democratic Party state, to now it's a Republican state. Has much change, you think? I think it started during this period we're talking about. Um, uh, 
and I think race was the reason for the, the big switch. Uh, it's hard to find a Democrat today. Uh, well, not in this room. Well, that, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what happened, Bill. I don't know if it was good or bad. It was, uh, uh, I've sort of, that was my one experience in politics, and I, I couldn't have worked for a better man. I'm really proud to have worked for Carl Sanders. I, I think he's a great man. And, and if you look at what happened later, Carter, of course, became president. But I think a case can be made that um, uh, he was a mediocre president at best. He's been a really good ex-president, but I don't think his term in office uh, exempl. I mean, the guy did what he had to do to get elected. He's got a mean streak in him that most people don't know about. He's a smart guy and a good guy. And he did some great things as governor, but um, he said he would never tell us a lie. Well, you think that's a problem? The promise he kept. I think that in itself is uh, can be questioned. That statement. I mean, his records of the gubernatorial campaign are sealed. If you go to the Carter Library, uh, I'm told you can't even get close to the records of the gubernatorial campaign. Uh, that's true. And I feel a little put down by that because I wrote a lot of that stuff that they've sealed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's come back to the, the present. What, what, what's, what's on your agenda for the future, Robert? Late in life, I have uh, gotten good at what I do, and I have found my, my, my niche, which is writing uh, biographies of American heroes, of, of military people. and. Uh, most of my friends who are writers don't read my books. They don't even know about them. Oh, you write military biographies, how neat. But the, the core group, the U.S. military, in Georgia, more than most states, has a military background with Dick Russell and Carl Vinson, and we got enough military bases in the state to sink it almost. And we have a military legacy. But the people who do read my books are about as loyal and devoted as any writer could ever hope for. So I like what I'm doing. Uh, I'm going to keep doing it as long as I can. Uh, Robert, let's talk a little bit more about Cumberland Island and all the, uh, all the islands up and down the Georgia coast, how they became political footballs and how those islands were rescued in the end uh, by people who stopped playing football with them. If you remember, Jekyll Island was a major, major political issue. It was. In, in the uh, campaign that elevated Herman Talmadge to governor. But you take it, you go ahead. Well, Cumberland is emblematic of the turmoil that surrounded a lot of the barrier islands. Uh, when Cumberland became a national seashore, uh, the park came up with a management plan and it went through several evolutions. Uh, the first one, when it was, when I was a ranger down there, and then uh, by 1980, 81, the Park Service came up with a final one. By then, I had left the island, and I was back at the paper, and I saw the management plan, and it envisioned, uh, I think, 1,500 or so people a day, X number of boats, uh, extra number of beaches, uh, concessionaires at different places, big uh, visitation centers. And underneath is a fundamental philosophical problem, and it, it boils down to, are there places in America that should not be, as harsh as this might sound, perhaps should not be made available or accessible to everybody? Uh, are there places within the National Park Service system that should not have developments or not have concessionaires? Should not there be a place remaining as pure and pristine as it can possibly be? It will never be like it used to be, but it's close. Uh, because of my experience on Cumberland, when this issue came up, I was at the paper, and I, I owned that story for about four or five months. Uh, nobody else wanted to do it, and I had the background for it. And I wrote articles almost daily, backed up in, in large part by Bob Engel, your associate on the sure. editorial side. Um, the Park Service got more than 4,000 letters from people in Georgia, and it showed a number of things. The Park Service had thought their constituency was uh, Camden County and the local area down there, and they found out 
the constituency was Atlanta because almost all of those letters came from Atlanta. And they 99.9% .9 spoke with one thought in mind, leave the island as it is. And this is the Federal Park Service, right? Th that's correct. The United Part of the yeah. Interior Department. Correct. And this was a national seashore. And they had thought they would impose, if you will, this management plan. And they were completely blindsided by the response because this is a bigger response than they would get when issues came up in Yellowstone or Yosemite. And Cumberland at the time was this obscure, unknown, remote barrier island visited by a maximum of 300 people a day. It was a new park. People had never heard of it. And suddenly 4,000 people are writing letters saying, leave the place alone. And to their credit, they listened. And I think... So what happened to the master plan? They threw it out. No they more threw out plan. 10 years worth of work, and they said the same thing over and over in several reincarnations of the master plan. But the Park Service, like many federal agencies, uh, they're always after bigger and bigger budgets. For a national park to get a bigger budget, you have to have more visitation. The more visitation, the more you can justify, well, we need another dock, or we need another boat, or we need a concessionaire. And people said, we don't want that on Cumberland. We want it to stay the way it is. Just leave the place alone. And it's still that way today. You can make a case it's not really a national seashore because inherent in the concept of a national seashore is mass visitation. It's a recreation area. Uh, lots of open beaches, people selling hamburgers, motels. And there are none of those on Cumberland Island. And no bridge to get over there either. The people in Camden County still want a bridge. They're fighting for that. Um, there are several constituencies for Cumberland. The wilderness people want to turn the whole place into a wilderness area and keep everybody out. The preservationists want to put much of the island into a uh, historic trust. And, and my response is to that, you can make a case that the post-1800 history of Cumberland is for naught. That's the Carnegie period. They built big houses, so what? Uh, unfortunately, they're prevailing, and that's the part that uh, many people want to see when they go to Cumberland Island, where are the big houses. There's a place called Plum Orchard up in the middle of the island, and the park through Jack Kingston and Gogo Ferguson and this uh, group they got for the preservation of Wild Cumberland got the federal government to take money from other needy places all over the country and to put it into refurbishing Plum Orchard. And the best thing that could happen to Plum Orchard would be a providential lightning strike. The place just ought to be burned down. There's nothing, it's a big house. You can see them on West Pace's Ferry every day. What do you need it on Cumberland Island for? This monument to robber barons. It's, it's just, but again, that's what people want to see. Well, you talk a little about the history of Jekyll, which is quite different from Cumberland. It is. But they all, all the houses down there look like robber barons, except the one more recently built, which looked like latter-day uh, yeah. low rent. See, when the, the Pulitzers and the Cranes and all those large families were using Jekyll as their playground, building the multi-million dollar cottages in the 30s uh, and so forth, the Carnegies bought Cumberland Island and they were down the road a little bit. And then the threat of submarines in World War II caused almost an overnight evacuation of Jekyll. And then the state came in, I think in the, what, 50s or so and bought it. Uh, for like less than a million, less, yeah, than, yeah, less yeah, than, yeah, like 700, I want to say thousand dollars, I think maybe that was right. There was a lawyer up your way, um, you would know his name, he was an expert in setting up these state, um, what do you call it, trust, not trust or foundations. Um, yeah, well, Ellis Arnold was into it and then uh, it came up, Marvin Griffin was running for governor. Yeah against somebody and he accused them, he accused Emmy Thompson of facilitating the giveaway of the taxpayers' money, which was a giveaway of a pittance to yeah. buy this gem of an island off the Georgia coast. And the village has been rehabbed over on the west side and it's a, a nice little place to go and look, but it's, that was about yesteryear. Um, most of uh, Jekyll is, is, uh, is not developed. It's a place primarily for snowbirds. It's, 
There's so many Canadians there in the wintertime, they fly the Canadian flag. It's, Canadians go swimming off Jekyll in January and all the local yeah, I know, you go there. down there and all these <laughs> guys are splashing around in frigid yeah, water. Yeah, and I'm wearing an overcoat. So, so. <laughs> As I as I've said, you were probably the national uh, expert on the drug trafficking, particularly in the Caribbean and uh, in Colombia. In fact, you became so notorious that at one point you were a wanted man. Is that right, Robert? Tell us about that. I did a piece for Esquire. Uh, it was the first piece on a national magazine about narcotics trafficking. And then after that, I did a piece in the Turks and Caicos. I flew up, I'm a pilot, and I flew a small plane down with a reporter from the Atlanta Constitution who smoked dope the whole time we were there. And, and the nature of the drug business is uh, such that the language is very indirect. People don't say, I'm going down to Columbia to get a load. They say, I'm going down south and I might be heavily loaded when I come back through and can I get gas? And, I did a story about the Turks and Caicos. It was just, uh, it had the radio frequencies to use. Uh, drug planes were parked on the ramp in broad daylight, filled with drugs, you can see it. Uh, uh, I was told how much to pay off to the customs guy, the immigration guy, the tower, the whole bit. After I did that story, um, somehow somebody got a picture, of, I don't know if it was a promotion picture for the paper or what, and a DEA undercover agent uh, was in Jamaica or somewhere in the Caribbean. And he came back and he said, your picture is inside the door on virtually every bar in the Caribbean. Uh, I wouldn't advise you going back down there for a while. He said, people are looking for you. Did you look for another topic to write about then? No, here's what I did. I made one more trip. And I, got, I let my hair get real long and I had the first permanent permanent, how do you say permanent, I've ever had in my life. I had a floofy blonde afro sticking out here. Boy, you must have looked great. And I was covered with gold chains, and I went with an undercover officer from Broward County, Fort Lauderdale, and we went to Bimini. Now, in a jurisdictional sense, the, the authority of the Broward County Sheriff ends at the Broward County line. We're venturing into a foreign country doing a law enforcement exercise which is espionage in a technical well, sense. Bimini is what, you can in, in the Bahamas. Yeah. And I, we left and I said, aren't we going to clear customs? And he said, no, we're not leaving, so why should we clear customs? So we go over there and we hit the dock at the big game club on Bimini. And I was staying in the boat because I didn't, uh, even with my disguise, I didn't want to go in there. The undercover officer would go inside and watch the boats loaded with drugs take off on a heading. And he would know from what heading they took out of Bimini where they were going, if they're going to Homestead, to Miami, to Fort Lauderdale, to West Palm, and he would call and have law enforcement people waiting on the other end. Well, some people on the dock got wise to us, and uh, we had to leave in a hurry, and um, we were being chased across the flats uh, by a boatload of uh, smugglers who were shooting at us. And uh, I looked back and I said, what are all those little, those little red dots back there? And he said, they're shooting at us. <laughs> and I said, oh, and he said, you got to jump overboard. I get paid to do this, but you don't. And this is Bimini, the home of the world's biggest shark research lab. And it's two o'clock in the morning, and he wants me to jump overboard a mile from shore. And I, we had some words about it, and I was hanging on to the bar. And um, he finally ran the boat into a mangrove thicket. And the smugglers went back and forth for about an hour or so looking for us. And the next morning we came back and I said, aren't we going to stop for customs? And he said, we never left the country. Why should we check in with customs <laughs> coming back? And that was my, I had met the person who was about to become my wife and that was my last venture in the drug smuggling business. Let me deviate for a second. That was cowboy journalism at its best. Enterprise journalism, they called it. Well, that's a what great. What happened? What happened? Well, there's a great point there because, in a theoretical, absolute sense, in journalism school, they teach you to be dispassionate and clinical and objective, and not to get emotionally involved, and to look at a subject, a subject, no matter how tempestuous it might be, like a bug in a microscope. And I found along the way there are several topics I couldn't do that with. Uh, Cumberland was one. 
Drug smuggling was another one. I don't know the reason, but I became a passionate anti-narcotics person. And I lost some friends over that because a lot of my friends were druggies and I just don't want to be around people who are using it or have used it. It's just, uh, I became a passionate advocate instead of an objective newspaper reporter. Um, Do you still regard yourself as a passionate advocate? I hope so. I hope so. Uh, I don't. I, if you don't feel passion for your work, why do it? And uh, uh, I certainly felt that way about several topics. About most things, I could be very clinical, but um, not about narcotics and not about Cumberland Island. And I'm very proud of the fact that because of the stories I did and the editorial support I got. By the way, for a reporter to write newspaper stories is one thing, but to have the support of the editorial side, that's the conscience of the paper, the voice of the paper. This is the Atlanta Constitution. And it adds a great deal of gravitas to have that imprimatur on a reporter's stories. And I was lucky in both of these to have a lot of support from the editorial side. Uh, Bob Engel was writing op-ed piece or editorial support almost every day on the Cumberland story. And you wrote a lot supporting the, uh, I remember when I, I was writing a seven part series about the drug culture in Atlanta, in schools and the whole bit, and the entire, st well, a big part of the staff of the B section, the features department, went to the managing editor and said, we think the work he's doing is nonsense and we're asking you, all of us, to stop that series, don't let it run. And some of those people went on to national fame. There were some very talented people in there. They were being influenced by what they were putting in their noses or smoking. And to the managing editor's credit, he let the piece run. Um, that's a good story and that's a great story that I think exemplifies the time you and I were both yeah. practicing daily journalism and playing cowboy and having a great time. Bill, we were there when giants walked the earth and um, we knew them and we worked with them and it was the greatest time of my life. It was the most fun I've ever had. It, uh, it was a postgraduate course in life and I, I wouldn't trade those years for anything. Do you think we'll ever get back to that kind of journalism or has, has the digital uh, age killed it all? There are no reporters anymore. They are digital content providers, and I don't think a digital <laughs> no content in that. <laughs> I don't. I don't think a digital content provider can feel passionate about a story. That's good. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Thank you.